What is a Byzantine soldier? Can you think of your favorite hero warrior from a movie or a cartoon? What is he like? Or what is she like? When I was a kid, my favorite warrior hero was Hercules. It was just after the cartoon went out and I loved seeing him and imagining him fight off everyone and anyone with his super strength. But what is a Byzantine soldier like? What is his job? Where does he live? Does he live in one place or does he move around? Does he have a horse? Does he carry a sword or a spear? Or a shear, a shield, or all of those things? Let's try and imagine. Let's try and create and look at the stories that tell us what a Byzantine soldier was like. There were many different types of soldiers all around the empire. Some were in the ports, carrying and working on the battleships called the galleys. Others were sent off with their fellow soldier with their fellow soldiers whenever it was necessary. Some lived on the borders, ready to defend the empire at all times, if someone tried to get in. Once an Arabian Caliphate became, became Byzantium's new neighbor, the Byzantines had to reorganize the way they'd protect the empire from frequent raids and attacks. So they gathered, thought hard, and decided to divide the land in smaller parts called themes, where soldiers can live and keep an eye on the borders. The problem arose when a bigger army would invade the most distant corners of the empire, and that would require a lot of help from the central military base. To solve this, Byzantines invented a signaling system of beacons that would stretch out from Lulon on the southeast border all the way to Constantinople. The guards would detect an enemy approaching they would light up the fire, which would give a signal to the next base, and they could activate the alarm. This would be repeated again and again and again and again for 720 kilometers all the way to the capital, where the emperor could learn about the danger in just one hour. Imagine if you could look out a window and see a light that would tell you what's happening hundreds of kilometers away right now. Would you be afraid? Well. Emperor Michael III thought this might be too scary for his people, and he decided to shut down the fire alarm. Another way to keep the empire safe was through spies. Good Byzantine generals had their spies, or scouts as they called them, infiltrating their neighbors' lands. Spies were often educated and bilingual which meant that they could speak two languages fluently. So they would go around the enemy's cities, dressed up like merchants or craftsmen, gathering the stories people would share. Books on strategy advised the generals to choose their scouts from foreigners, but only if no serious harm was done to them, so the spies wouldn't want to start plotting the revenge. The Byzantines were cautious and always ready to negotiate. In their military instructions, they advised that one should always prefer peace and refrain from war, and sometimes that meant cunning and trickery. For example, in the beginning of the 7th century, there was a Persian general called Sharbaraz, and he became very powerful. So his king started to suspect that he might turn against him. And as medieval kings did, he decided to get rid of him. Sent a letter to another general, ordering him to kill Sharbaraz. Through mysterious and treasonous ways, this letter ended up in the hands of the Byzantines, who decided this was a useful weapon. They called in Sharbaraz and showed him what was written. Outraged, the Persian decided to switch sides. And... On his way, he added 400 other commanders' names to the sentence letter. When others saw what their king had in mind, 
they all rushed to abandon him and turn to the Roman Emperor in Constantinople. So trickery prevailed. In general, Byzantines didn't encourage their soldiers to be foolishly brave. The idea of strong, angry men rushing into battle wasn't a great one in their books. Wars were won with planning and caution, not simple force or sacrifice. One of the greatest military emperors, Basil II, pretty much carefully sat in his headquarters, keeping an eye on all legions and strategies. If you read the military treaties, like the one by Focas, you can find advice like avoid battles with enemies of greater or equal strength. Yet bravery meant simply staying in formation. But not all spheres, spheres of life were deprived of heroic tales and knightly bravery. The most popular Byzantine epic was perhaps the one about a courageous soldier by the name of Digenes Akritis, a border lord with two roots. He, is a, he was a son of an Arab emir and one Byzantine general's daughter, and he possessed unusual strength and power. So even as a young boy, he was able to break a spine of a bear with his own hands. Hmm. Imagine that like Hercules. In his adventures, he kills a dragon, he defeats a group of bandits, and wins a combat with an undefeated warrior called Maximum. Look up at Maximum. She's an interesting warrior. Centuries after, the story of Digenis Akritis is still very much alive in Greek tradition and even in one fairly recent video game. He appears as a character in Assassin's Creed. Now let's look at some of the special powers Byzantium had to preserve its military might. The symbol of the Emperor's strength was its walls. Constantinople was a peculiar city, surrounded by water on each side but its east. Laying down a Bosphorus Strait, it was difficult to attack it from the sea as well. Additionally, it was surrounded by great double walls, significantly upgraded in the time of Emperor Theodosius, so they bear his name. They remained unbreachable up until they faced a new power, powerful weapon we now know as gunpowder, brought in during the siege of the Sultan Mehmed II. It's not that other, that other armies didn't try hard to break them. They sure did. Over the centuries, different forces faced the great walls of Constantinople in long, hard attempts to bring them down, but with no luck. But in the 7th century, when the emperor faced particularly fierce attacks from the Arabian Caliphate, Byzantium reached out for another special power. According to Theophanes the Confessor, a clever architect named Kalinikos invented a technology of cannons that shot fire which can burn on water. Remember water? The thing that puts down the fire? Well, not anymore. The weapon became known as the Greek fire. Soldiers would pour hot liquid solutions into long tubes and discharge it on the enemy's fleet. The whole process generated fear and devastation in the enemy's lines, and the tubes produce loud, roaring, dreadful sounds that were followed by blazes and destruction. Faced with this unusual weapon, the Rus army fled, and they claimed that they would rather drown than to be struck by this lightning from heaven. But in the end, we should remember that behind those extraordinary stories of adventures and powers and fires and walls and invincible heroes, we're looking at ordinary people, just like you and me. Didn't have Netflix or Disney, but still did have the need to entertain themselves. Exciting tales were necessary, and the military was a great place for that. Not necessarily for something that has to do with battle, but all the things that go with campaigning, with living, with preparing for combat, with everything. So for example, we can find stories in the sources about stubborn soldiers who didn't want to wear their hat 
in the winter, so they ended up sick. Or about special trainings where soldiers would have to jump up and down on one leg on some kind of an inflated sack while trying to balance it. Other times, we learn of peculiar injuries that would occur during the fights. There was this one young brave fellow who managed to get an arrow into his head, but he still continued fighting without taking it out, finished his battle, did his deeds, and then tried to find the local military doctor who would take out the arrow. He was fine afterwards, but it was a strange way to fight. And my favorite story is a story of, well, sort of friendship with a Roman and a Goth. During the siege of Rome in the 6th century, a Roman soldier fell into a hole, the one that was used to store grain outside of walls. He couldn't get out, but he also couldn't call for help because he was afraid, since the enemy's army was still around fighting. So he stayed quiet. But the next day, he got a visit from a goth soldier. And then two men found themselves in the same hole. They couldn't get out, but they made a deal that whomever manages to find help would help the other one. Eventually, gods came and took them out, but they saved the Roman too. This is my story of soldiers and fights. Thank you.